But for the live albums, they're like, eh, who cares? We'll just keep tinkering with it. And it's like turned into George Lucas with a special edition. It's like every time they put it out, they've changed something else. I can't take well, it anymore. <laughs> David Byrne stepping on Jabba the Hutt's tail is something that I, <laughs> I didn't know I needed until they put it in. <laughs> I've been doing a lot of a lot of uh, saw making sensing lately. Apparently, so, Jesus. Because are you literally going frame <laughs> by frame and going, look at that? So I am planning to do some videos on that. It'd probably be a separate channel, but I, I have a lot to say about it because they've just come out with a new. Well, they're about to come out with a new version of the film. So this is the second reissue of this film that they've put out. The first one was in 1999, where they remixed all the music and restored the film. I had no quibbles with how the, the restored film looked great. Um, it was nice to have it on DVD finally, because we never got, which I'm going to do in a second, this version of the film, which we got in 1984. They called it, they called it the special edition back then because it had three extra songs in it. There were Cities, and uh, then there was the medley of Big Business and Ezimbra. That happens later in the film which has some of the best moments of the whole concert. I always considered this to be the definitive version of the film, even though I, you know, the movie that was in the theaters at River Oaks Theater was the one that changed my life. This is the one that continued to hone my life <laughs> for many years afterwards. So when they restored it, it looked great. I had no problems with how it looked. They, all this, you know, they didn't change any of the shots or anything, but for the remix of the actual music, they changed a lot. I mean, most uh, people probably would listen to it and go, I don't, sounds good to me. I don't get what's wrong. But there's a lot of really arbitrary seeming changes they made to um, the vocals, like David Burns' vocals, for example. Uh -huh. hey. And most notoriously, the Tom Tom Club sequence. What you gonna do when you get out of Throughout the whole song, Chris France is doing all this, check it out, check it out. James Brown, all that stuff. At one point, right after the line where Tina Weymouth sings. He goes, uh, and so they, they changed that and they remixed the 1999 version. They changed that to, and everything is just jumping out of sight all night. I still well, don't they, know what the story was. They bothered to have was. him come in and do that, like a, in a dub? We don't know. I, I don't know if anybody has record of this, whether, whether that was something that Chris France overdubbed in 1999 for the remix or if it was one of the other alternate performances from the three right. that they taped for the film. Right. To right. me, it sounds, didn't sound like something he would, everything was jumping and out of sight all night. It just sounds like this lame thing that they came up with to rhyme with what he said before. Tom Tom Club is cool. <laughs> I wish I kept my mouth shut a little bit more than I did. You know this movie so very well that y you are the person that sits there going like, yes, that one line, I caught it. Yeah. Well, I mean, and we'll get it. And this is one of the reasons I want to talk about revisionism in Hollywood. It goes beyond little things like that. They just now came out. Well, it was one, when I was on tour, they came out with a new, yet another new mix of all the music. And the big promotional thing was it's for the first time ever, it's the whole concert on vinyl. We've never had the whole concert on vinyl. Oh, before. wow. Because this one, the original LP, it's a yeah. single LP only had nine of the songs and to fit it on one LP, they, they edited them down. So some of them, yeah, Robin of them. and I had that. We had that album. Yeah. But the cassette, this is a cool thing about it at the time at, out at the same time was the cassette and the CD, which had the full versions of these nine songs, not shortened at all. So it was like, okay, uh, this is very much you with. This is very much like me with sticks as Kilroy was here. Uh, oh really? <laughs> no, <I'm joking>. oh. <laughs> I was like, "Wow, that's interesting." The new the new album is out now. The new LP. I've not bought the LP, but it also came out on streaming. And I thought, "Well, this oh. will be interesting." And I, I, it occurred to me when I was on when I was on tour, I was doing a late night drive into Montana. Pulled it up, listened to it, and the first thing I went for was was uh, found a job. <laughs> One of the most annoying edits they made in 1999 was to found a job. And uh, where they, they just shorten the end of it, like they cut out the last bit. 
so but they, they shortened a lot of songs on that suit to fit all the songs on the one cd in 1999 that's what they did so that's the first thing i jumped to in this new mix i was like did they put the whole thing in no they didn't it's edited down and i was just like god damn it. Oh. Stop, stop listening to it I, I since have listened to the rest of it and it's again because even with a double lp they still had to shorten stuff you know, I know they have to do the same thing for the original 84 LP that held up well, a second ago. Well, they do a digital soundtrack uh, since they're doing the movie that will have the full concert. Are they just going to release that as a soundtrack? Because you don't need sides. It's not about it being on vinyl. So well, therefore, you can literally have, you know, a two hour yeah. concert. I'm sure it will come out on home video. I'm assuming, you know, it's a 4K restoration this time. So you would think it's going to come out on Blu-ray or something like that. Yeah. So hopefully there will be, I mean, I, at the very least I could, you know, dub the audio or, you know, copy the audio off the Blu-ray, but there's been no announcement of an actual, there's been no announcement of an actual CD oh. release this time. Yes. Well, I, that's what I'm saying. I don't think it needs to be a CD since now all, no one really gives a shit about physical. I mean, the collectors want to have a vinyl and I get it, well, but that's as the far, thing. you know, as far as just, sound files it's no longer a thing about the storage space so they can literally just take the audio track of what they've remastered and that mm-hmm. could be the soundtrack but this is this was my thing is that they've taken the lp edits and put them out on streaming they didn't mm. did not give us the full versions of the songs on streaming even though they could have as you're saying and that's that's the thing that has annoyed me and i went on this this uh talking heads group on facebook and I'm not the only one who's annoyed. Some people are like, this is great. It's all the songs in one one thing. I'm like, yeah, but it's not the whole songs. And it's just I'm a stickler for this stuff because you don't it, they don't they don't treat Sonic and Sense with the same reverence that they do the rest of their catalog. You know, they're not there there are bonus track versions of the of the other studio albums out, you know, Speaking in Tongues, Fear of Music, all that. They have bonus tracks on those. They didn't shorten <laughs> the other songs to fit the bonus tracks on, you know, they're right. not going to do that. But for the live albums, they're like, eh, who cares? We'll just keep tinkering with it. And it's like turned into George Lucas with a special edition. It's like every time they put it out, they've changed something else. I can't, I can't take well, it anymore. <laughs> David Byrne stepping on job of the Hutt's tail is something that I, <laughs> I didn't know That's... I needed until they put it in. I was like, there he is. <laughs> Which I do, I do like that little bit, but it's like, the, the, you know, that's probably the scene that they spent the most time on because they didn't I know. Remember, that's one and of it looks scenes. bad. <laughs> that's the only it, problem. The whole that, scene doesn't belong. It doesn't belong there. It's redundant. No, because the, it's redundant because all that dialogue. We've talked about this before, but all that dialogue yeah. is pretty much in the Greedo scene. Mm-hmm. And so it's repetitive where it's like, hey, you know, even the best smugglers get boarded from time to time. Even I get boarded sometimes. Do you think I had a choice? Even I get boarded sometimes. Do you think I had a choice? Wow, you said that to Greedo too. Is that just in your head, Han? You just constantly got to have that self defense of like, hey, hey. Yeah. The only thing it adds is us seeing Jabba <laughs> right off the bat. And it adds like Boba Fett walking and going, where am yeah. I? Yeah. <laughs> like, He's why am I here again? again? What is this? Yeah. Uh, My tongue I know at one point you took some guns out of E.T. and then regretted that, it. That was How a mistake. You... That was a mistake. There's a fascinating uh, difference between Lucas, the attitudes of George Lucas to Steven Spielberg, where he, yeah. you know, he, he was he succumbed to the same temptations to change E.T., the, the, the whatever it was, the 20th anniversary release where he went back and just like Lucas did with the original trilogy. Yeah, and he swapped out the rifles. a bunch of stuff. For yeah, yeah. Radio. Airbrush out the rifles, which was a very sort of hand shot first kind of thing to do. And then later Spielberg's like, ah, that was a mistake. And so he put the original version out again. And then he, he said in that, that article I sent you, he says that when people ask him which version of the film they should watch, he says, watch the original, the 82. Don't watch my special edition. Watch, watch the original cut. Yeah, I should never have messed with the archive of my own work, and I don't recommend anybody really do that. Your your film, all our movies are a kind of um, measuring, sort of a signpost of where we were when we made them. And that's you'll never hear Lucas say that, and it it it, it it's kind of heartbreaking. So well, that, that's the, the same it, reason why it's like I want the original version of this movie, the original, the original. The heartbreak <sighs> there is is uh, it's understandable. At the same time. So is the artistic impulse. 
I, I don't think that George Lucas has improved almost anything with his special editions, but I will say, <laughs> but I will say yeah. it's totally his right because this is his thing. And he's, he, if he feels the need to keep tinkering with it, the rest of us can go, stop, man, we're happy. We're good. But if he's not happy, he's the artist, he's allowed. So, I mean, I'll die on that hill while I'll sit there going like, you know, I, I'll be fine with the theatrical release that I saw in 77. He's not. It's It reminds me of, uh, you know, Frank Frazetta, right? No. Classic. Oh, Frank Frazetta, classic fantasy illustrator, painter. Almost any book cover of the 1970s that had Conan or whatever. I mean, he's the guy who did these amazing paintings. He's got a museum. So he was more than just like a book jacket guy. But Frank Frazetta is one of the big names. And some of his paintings have been turned into T-shirts and posters for decades and that kind of thing. But even the most famous ones, I read a story, his wife had to lock up the paintings because he would go down. She would find him in the middle of the night tinkering with paintings that were 25 years old. There was something bugging him about it. And she go, Frank, everyone already knows this image. It's like, it's out there. It's on all the stuff they know. And so he's like, going, yeah, but I'm just not done. And it's not like that kept him from doing other stuff because the man was prolific and painted and painted. But the the even the most famous images that he was known for, uh, she would have to lock them away. Otherwise, he'd go in and go, yeah, I'm just I'm working on a thing. And she's like, stop changing it. Stop changing it. That thing. <laughs> it was done in 1975. And here he is in 1992 going almost almost ready <laughs> stop it frank it's the same thing i do get it where it's like um the artist is the one who says when it's done but i will say that spielberg is also the healthier mindset which is part of artistry and this goes for music writing art all, any of it is uh being able to walk away and go I might have been able to make this better. And you hear novelists say this all the time. It's like, there's still things in this that bug me, but I had to let it go. It's like, it is now published. That's it. And it's like, that's always going to, that paragraph is always going to needle me. And I know I can make it better, but it's Absolutely. basically like, but I had to move on. I had to yeah. do other things. So yeah. yes, you have to send your baby out into the world. Uh, I get on my brother's back about that all the time because he's, been working on this play which i like a lot and i've read a couple of drafts of it it's up in its seventh or eighth draft and i do know polishing is a big deal but i keep going like is this really you polishing or is it you having an excuse why you're not gonna find a cast and put this on the stage it's like yeah i think it's ready and he's mm -hmm. like i don't know i i need to keep working and i'm like okay Call me in another 12 years. Let me know when it's ready to go. Yeah. So I, I get it. So Lucas, he's got all the time in the world and all the money in the world, and he's probably sitting there working on the director's cut of Willow. We have no idea. <laughs> well, I really liked it, but there's this one thing where the brownies are doing <laughs> this, and I, I just I kept thinking, I could do better, right? The, the brownies could be funnier. Yeah. <laughs> they could use CGI to make the jokes funnier. <laughs> Yeah, new, yeah. I'm, uh, I'm going to fix that uh, Jar Jar problem. Uh, <laughs> I think what the audience is, they didn't get enough Jar Jar. So in the new cuts, <laughs> it's the all Jar Jar cut. The all Jar -Jar. We, really, we really get inside his head. And uh, <laughs> I think he becomes a more sympathetic character. He's that kind of guy. God bless him. Well, it's, it's like it's like with remakes. It's like I, I don't begrudge him wanting to keep changing the films. I think Obviously, I think the thing that most of us, the problem that most of us have is that while he's putting the special editions out, he's taken away the original ones. Like if, if you didn't have a copy of it already. That, that, that was the dick move. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a cool thing with Spielberg. He's put out, I think it was the 30th anniversary release. He put out the special edition with the original cut in the same. That's the one package. I have. That's yeah. the one I have, and it's the Blu-ray, and it's got both cuts. And really, it is his stuff was very tiny. I do think that Don't was a dumb choice things. that he made. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Compared to Star Wars, where he really did want to go, oh, I've got new toys, and I want to show you Womp Rats. And I'm like, great, now I know what a Womp Rat looks like. Mm-hmm. Awesome. And for some reason, Anakin, after he dies, goes and becomes a young guy. That must the force is awesome. The force allows you to be young and hot again. <laughs> Why wasn't you and McGregor standing there next to him? I like, know. Hey, everybody. It, hey. It'd be great if they if they use CGI or something to have him go like look over at Anakin, do a double take. Like, yeah. hey, <laughs> hey. And then Yoda's force ghost is a baby Yoda. It's like Grogu. <laughs> anyway, yeah, and I. What's I, uh, new? <laughs> uh, one, one more thing sorry I'll, I'll get off this in a second but a good example this is like All more of the Spielberg, the Spielberg attitude yeah the Beatles put these out and they were offered sort of as alternatives to the original masters right of course exactly and you can still never find the original the masters away. on Spotify right. yeah they're still out there they're still for sale and that's a much better way to do it and the, the yeah, problem is too with Star Wars and, and something making sense by the time they came out on DVD you couldn't buy the these originals like the, the, the original right. cut they had the original Star Wars to VHS buried back there. That's what they yeah. put out ahead of ahead of the special edition, saying you better buy these. That's now. why the that's why the Laserdisc box sets became so pricey the on the collector's that's, market that's right, because yeah. the Laserdisc had the original theatrical, you know, and they weren't yeah. remastered. They looked maybe better than the VHS, but still, right? They were going least, for crazy amounts of money. And at least they're probably not deteriorating at the same rate that these are. Same well, thing with this. This was out on Laserdisc too. Laser rot is is a thing. Is it, and I, is it really? It is. That sounds like a band name. Yeah, it does. It, it, they break down whatever the material is. It it breaks down after I think twenty or thirty years. So at this point, I bet a bunch of people with their laser disc Star Wars stuff are going like, "Uh oh, it's going." But I'm sure they've ripped it at some point. I'm sure there's some way to digitally transfer. But yeah, Lucas. That's also a thing where it's like that's he he's letting money go even though that he doesn't own it anymore right he could literally just do like i've cleaned up the original theatrical cuts and so you know collectors would be like yeah i'm buying them again i already have them in every version and now i'm gonna buy them again because these are cleaned up versions of the original Mm -hmm. cuts that's money that he's like um no i'm good thanks (laughs) Thankfully, you have the, those despecialized editions that yeah. that uh, that guy Harmy, I think his name is. Yeah, there are uh, plenty of people that have. And they're gorgeous. Yeah, yeah, they like fan very well done. edits. Mm-hmm. I have bootlegs of, and I think the my bootleg uh, DVDs are someone ripped the laser discs. So, I mean, again, they're not official, but um, yeah. yeah, I mean, I've got the Blu-ray box set, which is gorgeous of the entire skywalker saga all nine m- movies uh and i love it but at the same time i will occasionally pop in it's like yeah i want to watch what i saw when i was eight years old yeah it's like, yeah there it is it's really uh satisfying and i, I did i'm happy i'm so glad that those those spe- despecialized editions were, were done because that's that's what i used to educate my little brother <laughs> back when ah. he was when he was like 1920 or something, he and his girlfriend came over to my mom's house and we sat and we did a Star Wars marathon of all three of the so D special editions. So he had gotten editions. to 20 years, uh, oh, but he had oh, seen, he'd seen the movies, movie. but he, okay. he, the special special editions is what the gotcha. versions he grew up gotcha. with. So I said, look, here's the, the original. And I think he told me that those have become his preferred versions of the film. So he, he went and got his own, Han downloaded his first. own copy of them. Han's so, yeah. a badass. So Harmy, whatever, I think it's his name, the guy who did those, he, 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 he did God's work. And, you, uh, you're giving him again, a shout out. There you go. Yeah, I mean it's important. It's 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 preservation. It's historical preservation. Yeah. So, yeah. And I don't hey. feel bad about my bootleg. No, Lucas has gotten either. so much goddamn money out of me. It's like know. whatever, dude. Whatever. Yeah. Again, I had Chewbacca socks, so we go back <laughs> to that. Anywho, uh, so uh, other than your tour, did you see any movies? What did you do? I literally haven't I have talked not, in like two and a half weeks. It's all I, right. I have not been to the theater since I last saw you. Uh, the last oh. movie I saw was Oppenheimer. And, uh, it was but okay. I will, before, we're talking about having your friend John on next week. So I would like to. Uh, I'm going to check with him. But yes, okay. I would like to because I think it would be great to do kind of a 
capsule of of summer movies. We're wrapping it up at this point. There's nothing really big coming out that yeah. uh, I feel that I've missed. Uh, I still haven't seen Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. That is on the list. I still haven't seen Mutant Mayhem. But thanks to, oh, someone who will remain nameless, who doesn't want the credit, uh, I've been able to... Um, <laughs> I've been able to see. I saw That's Oppenheimer hard. and Barbie, and I, I saw uh, Last Voyage of the Demeter and Blue Beetle. Um, wow! Yeah, you've been hitting. Yeah, it. I've been checking. Good. I've been hitting it. I've been hitting it. And just in general, I enjoyed them all. <laughs> oh, good. Yeah, I was going <laughs> to say but before we move on to your your Superman, the, the Superman thing you we want need to talk to about, which I do too. We always need to talk about Superman. <laughs> we. Always what did you do. think of Blue Beetle? I mean, you know, you um, said you liked it. But- well, I did like it. It is upper tier DCEU or DCU or however they want to say it now. In other words, it will not change anyone's mind about anything. But the casting's great. I mean, really, everybody's supporting characters. George Lopez owns the movie. Weirdly, he's so great in it. Um, and the kid from Cobra Kai, who I should learn his name because he's Blue Beetle and he's really good. It has its heart in the right place. It is not continuity heavy, though it is. uh, I was very happy to uh, see that they are allowing for all the Blue Beetles. Ted Cord is a big part of the subplot, even though we don't see him. And Dan Garrett, the original 1940s, which I don't think they're putting him in the 40s, but Dan Garrett was... Ted Cord's professor, and they're acknowledging that there have been other Blue Beetles, and I'm like, all right, I love that. Meanwhile, it is Jaime's movie, and he's great, so it's a lot of fun. I put it up there, like with Wonder Woman and Aquaman, uh, Shazam. I'm not as huge a fan of, but it, in other words, still not as great as a Marvel movie, but but solid DC stuff, and you can see why James Gunn was like, this could totally be in my universe because it doesn't contradict anything. Right. Um, and and if you wanted Superman to do something with Batman, Ted Cord, I guess mm-hmm. still there. Superman yeah. and Batman are mentioned and uh, they get shout outs, Gotham, uh, you know, so in other words, it's comfortably not associated with what Snyder did and comfortably able to be fit into whatever guns about to do. So I enjoyed it and I'm sorry it hasn't done well. I, I, I think it is a thing where people are like, none of this stuff matters. I think audiences are like, yeah, this doesn't matter because uh, they're starting all over. Aquaman 2, when that comes out, I feel bad for that already. Yeah. Well, it's interesting. People too, that, are ready to abandon all of that. Yeah, their abandon ship. Um, <laughs> the, there was a video I watched recently that, because it's not just the Marvel stuff that's bombing now. Obviously, we, we know that. Indie. Oh no! There's yeah, no, in general, things are not thing with indie. Well. There was a video I watched. I think it was last night, uh, where the guy was saying you know, the whole this whole idea of summer blockbusters that right. used to be you know, back when we were growing up. That was literally meant you know people would be lined up around the block, up and down the block, yeah. trying to waiting to get buy tickets. We are the generation that started that even though it wasn't our money it was our parents money but we blockbusters and summer blockbusters that whole thing started with spielberg it started with spielberg and lucas jaws, yeah. it was literally jaws and star wars mm-hmm. and from that point on so that is right in our sweet spot so we are that generation that's sitting there going like dude summer is where all the big ones are gonna hit and we be- gotta get our seats early and all this and now it is just sort of like my voice is cracking. That's how, and now it's all about, <laughs> but it, it is sort of like, we can wait for it to stream or, um, that. like yeah. no reason to see it on opening night. We'll go see it some point. I mean, people well, are still excited by upcoming movies, but I don't think it is that same. The last time I saw that was a Marvel movie and it was, uh, it was in game literally lying around the block. People just, you know, yeah. And it was an event. I get it. But so th- since this guy's pandemic- argument, this guy's argument was th- that the blockbuster has become itself. The idea of a blockbuster has become something that's unsustainable because there's right. so many of them that are trying to be blockbusters that have yes. blockbuster budgets that they have no chance of recouping now. In yeah. Today's market yeah. Because yeah. like you say, 
pe- people, especially people with big families who have a, a kid or more than one kid, they can't yeah. afford to go see more than one movie a month. You know, that's like, yeah. it's going to break the bank for, for these families. Yeah. And so, yeah, we'll just wait till it comes out on Netflix or, you know, I think whatever. in general, Hollywood is for a lot of different reasons, but clearly that um, they're starting to get the idea. We need to scale back and try to boost smaller films. And they don't have to be like boring dramas or or wacky comedy. I think in general, you can still do genre stuff that's on a smaller scale and they're hoping that audiences will will flex. We'll go, that's cool. Yes, we're now accepting of things. It is encouraging that we got, I mean, Barbie wasn't a hugely expensive movie, though, you know, it looks amazing. But Oppenheimer, also, you're sitting there going like, that's encouraging. People were out to see that movie. Yes, it's Christopher Nolan, but you're sitting there going like, that is not what you would think of as being like a big hit of the summer. But it worked. And Asteroid City, you know, I mean, Wes Anderson's latest film, which I that one's another one I wanted to see. But I think don't think it's in theaters anymore. I think I missed it. Uh, I'll have to see it when it streams. But it did really well. So, yeah, Hollywood's going like, oh, let's readjust our thinking, because one thing we can't afford just to keep putting out 200, 300 million dollar movies that don't make that money back. Yeah. Stop making Hollywood do that, Chad. <laughs> You're the guy who's always going like, hey, Hollywood, hey, could could you only make movies that are $300 million? Yeah. <laughs> I promise I'll go see it once. <laughs> so, so you have clearly got like $13 out of me. Uh, hey, you remember uh, when you were a kid uh, when movie prices would go up and it'd be like, what, $2 for a movie? I, I like remember the jump from now. five to five fifty. It was like, oof, <laughs> Jesus! <laughs> when we I do want to see this, but it's seven dollars. Yeah. Okay, Hollywood. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well done. I'll go see your Terminator Two Judgment Day. Seven dollars, <laughs> and <laughs> and that little flash to the past is brought to you by me. Yeah. All right. So we've come to the most important part, and maybe we could answer some questions from people, too, at some point. But the most important thing that I want to talk about today comes from this book, The Dailies, The Silver Age Dailies, 1959-1961. Superman Gorgeous. was a long-running comic strip. People forget that it was also in the papers. And I've got the other two volumes that finish out. This is the first one of the Silver Age comics. Oh, that's a big boy, isn't it? Yeah, nice. Well, yeah. Yeah, it is. And it it covers, again, two years of daily strips, black and white. Nice. Obviously. The thing that I found interesting about this is I didn't know this. The Most of the storylines for the comic strip were lifted from the comic book. And so basically, and they were written by Jerry Siegel. This is like one of the steady jobs he had. The creator of Superman at least got fairly steady work adapting stories that he didn't write for the comic books. So he, the comic books would come out and Jerry Siegel would take the same story and adapt it for daily comic strips. This volume includes one of the biggest and most important Superman stories, which is so weird that this awesome cover doesn't include as one of the ones they're talking about, but Superman's return to Krypton and one of the big ones uh, of the silver age, which was he goes through a time warp. He ends up on Krypton. He can't escape because it's under red sun. So his powers are gone, but he's back in time and he gets to be friends with his parents. And they're like, we like you, Cal. And he's like, Oh, that's great. And then it's like, thought balloons are like mom dad i wish i could save you choke you know that kind of thing he falls in love with krypton's most famous movie actress <laughs> uh who has who has uh ll name i think her name is like lila laral or something like that then anyway so a lot of storylines in this but the one i wanted to bring up this just struck me as unbelievable and it's one where i didn't I don't remember the comic version, uh, and it is The Perfect Husband 
is the name of this uh, this storyline, which ran from uh, May 1961, blah, blah, blah. All right, here's the story. So Lois and her sister Lucy go to the taping of a TV show called People Are Wacky. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm already loving it. They go to a taping and the whole thing is people are wacky for this week. They've got this computer called Brainiac, which is interesting. It's not the villain Brainiac, but the computer named Brainiac is a dating computer. And wait, 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 you, wait, back up. Is this before Brainiac was a thing? Like before no, the actual I think character? Brainiac was already a thing. This was them so being they're... lazy. Yeah. This okay. has just been the beginning. <laughs> okay. It has just no to be tie clear. in. No, just to be clear, has no tie in to Brainiac, the villain. So <laughs> this, they were just being lazy. So the machine is like a, it. They're doing in 1961 a computer dating storyline, and Lucy is like, I got to get Lois over this Superman fixation. So she has submitted Lois's information without Lois knowing. And so the host of the TV show is like, we're putting one of our audience members information into the, and we'll find the perfect husband. That's me being brainiac. And then the, <laughs> it's one of my better impressions. And then cha cha Chang, they're like, and Lois Lane, you're the per an honest person. She's like, what? She looks at her sister. How could you? And she's like, it was just for you, sis. So <laughs> Lois goes up on the stage and she's like going, well, clearly in her mind, she's like, clearly it's going to say Superman because he's the only man for me. And the computer spits this name out and she goes uh, and they're like, oh, and it's this guy. We've already had him brought to the studio. Here he is. And it goes up and the guy is Clark Kent, but he's not. She's like Clark Kent. And he goes, no, actually. Uh, and wait, what's his name? Hold on, I'll find out. His name is Roger Warner Sportsman. <laughs> he announces himself as Roger Warner Sportsman. Comma, but he Sportsman. Does. Yeah. Yes. He looks exactly Not Warner like Warner Gash Sportsman. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm of the main Warner Sportsman's. <laughs> So anyway, she's thrown by the fact that this guy looks so much like Clark, but they start dating and she's like, well, I'll give it a whirl. He turns out to be awesome. He turns out to be sweet, charming, intelligent, also not bad on the eyes. And she's and the whole thing is you're thinking like these are these types of stories It's like, has Clark put on a disguise to be a different guy? No. Clark is walking around going, so how's things going with that Roger Warner guy? Okay, they're going good. And she's like, he's just, he's so dreamy. And he's like, oh, okay. And then his thought balloons are like, I guess I've lost my chance with Lois. And every time it's when they're dating, Clark's leaving them alone, but something will happen and Roger will step up. Like they almost get mugged. Roger steps up, takes the guy out. He goes, well, I, I am a vet. You know, I was in the army and and he's not super at all, but he's always capable. She's like, I think I finally found a real dreamboat guy. Like, he's the one. I don't need Superman. He's never going to pick me. So instead, Roger Warner, he's my dude. So this is going really well. And even Superman has all these self-pitying. Like, he does protect them from a couple things that Roger Warner couldn't do. Like, Oh, the pontoon on their pontoon plane is I'll make sure they're safe. That kind of thing. So everything's going well. And then Roger proposes and Lois is like, I, I might have to marry this guy. He's great. She meets the family. Oh, it's so wonderful. But they're on a yacht. And, uh, when she's meeting the family and he's proposed, Roger has Lois, is like, oh, I think I might say yes. Superman has to save them for something, but he always doesn't want to ruin the date. So he does it all like surreptitiously. They don't even know Superman is protecting them. And he, I don't know, something happens with the yacht. He protects them, but when he flies away, the wind he creates blows off Roger's wig. <laughs> I don't know if you can see that. There it is. <laughs> is it Lex? Is Lex in disguise? No, no. Oh. it's Roger Warner. 
So here's how this goes. This is Lois actually talking. Gasp, Roger, your hair. That sudden breeze is blown off a wig. <laughs> and uh, Roger's like, oh my gosh. Uh, and she goes, you're bald, completely bald. <laughs> and then she has a thought balloon that there isn't even one hair on his head. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, <laughs> and then he goes excuse me Lois then he says excuse me Lois gulp I, I must go below I can't face her I can't bear to look at Lois's shocked dismayed ex- expression and then <laughs> so he bails she goes bald I can't believe it and he goes Lois has discovered my one deception uh, she'll never look at me with the same loving eyes again I must get away fast <laughs> Uh, he flees in a boat, leaving <laughs> his, leaving his parents on the yacht with Lois, and and she goes. Uh, the mother goes. Roger's farewell note to you tells why he left without saying goodbye. Dear Lois, forgive me for deceiving you. I should have told you I was bald, <laughs> <laughs> but I was too vain, too dishonest. And then Lois says out loud. Uh, but his baldness wouldn't have mattered. And then in Thought Balloon, or would it? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so then... So it's an anti toupee story, right? I guess. But then, uh, flashback to people are wacky, and for some reason, Clark is standing next to her like, I guess I'm just the buddy. But basically, the host goes, too bad things didn't work out, Miss Lane. Would you like to try again for the perfect husband? And she goes, "Uh, no, Mr. Walsh. I think I'll stick to my original choice, though he's a little harder to get. At least I'm sure that Superman won't lose his hair. (laughs) Okay. God damn. That is so... I mean, yeah, 1961. But that is so horrible. Roger it Warner, we'll, we'll never hear from again. And the whole thing was, I can't believe Lois saw me without my wig on. And she's even going like, well, he was perfect. Too bad about the bald thing. And then I, I did reflect, what is it with Golden Age, Silver Age comics, classic comics, and their anti-bald stance? We need to talk about it simply because DC's the worst, man, going all the way back. Let's not forget, Lex Luthor, in his first appearances, had hair. Luthor had hair. And he didn't have a first name. He was just Luthor. Yeah. He had a a red hair. Then, uh, but at the same time, one of Superman's first villains, in fact, his first supervillain pre-Luthor, was Ultra Humanite. And Ultra Humanite, I know, weird name. Ultra Humanite is what we associate as Lex Luthor. He's a brilliant scientist in a lab coat, and he's bald. Uh, so Superman fought Ultra Humanite a few times, and then it's almost as if they just decided to swap. And they're like, okay, well, no, Luthor is now just bald. No explanation. Years later, you get the whole thing about he and Superboy were friends in Smallville, and oh, he accidentally caused him to lose his hair. Eh. But... The thing I love is that Ultra Humanite becomes this weird character that can move his brain, his mind into different bodies. So he becomes a sexy um, woman movie star, even though it's still Ultra Humanite. And he uses that to like, no one would ever guess that I'm Ultra Humanite because I'm in the sexy woman's body. Interesting. Then years later, he gets his mind put into this huge white gorilla. <laughs> Anyway, Ultra Humanite, I love him because he's whack. But Luther, the whole bald (laughs) thing. So essentially, and here's another factoid. I bet you don't even know this. Siegel and Schuster, the first Superman they ever wrote about was for uh, their fanzine they did when they were teenagers before Superman. I think Jerry Siegel just got the word Superman from like Nietzsche or something. And it it just stuck in his head. He's like, I love it. The idea of it. They wrote Mm -hmm. a science fiction. Well, he wrote a science fiction story and Joe Schuster did illustrations for it called Reign of the Superman. And it's the Superman of the story is a brilliant scientist 
dictator who wants to take over the world. So he's not a good guy. So the first Superman Siegel and Schuster wrote about was a bald, evil genius scientist. And then a couple of few years later, like, man, I still like that name, Superman. What if he was a good guy and had lustrous black hair? <laughs> yeah. So, um, so somehow in the 1930s and 40s, to be bald meant you were evil. Robin used to have a joke in his act where uh, bald people, when he was a kid, because of all the TV shows and movies he watched, he always assumed bald people were androids or from the future. <laughs> <laughs> it's like that yeah. was sort of like a stock image. It's like, oh, Yul Brenner in Westworld. Okay, robot. Perfect. Right. Well, at least we did have the king and I, but that, of course he had the to king be like a, yes. an exotic person from another country. Exactly, you know? exactly. Uh, and he was pretty much the first, I think, bald sex symbol because bald mm -hmm. actors in general in movies and so forth were always like character actors or bad guys or comedic relief. It's like because you couldn't be a sexy bald guy until Yul Brenner yeah. was like, why not? Then it was like, yeah, okay. We had, okay. It was Yul Brenner and then... Um, you know, uh, Kojak was like the only, yeah, the only other, Wallace. you know, yeah. Tony Wallace. Who and then, baby? you know, we, I mean, we don't have to list them all, but Patrick Stewart did a lot for, for bald. Yeah. Men. That's what I was going to say is that I, I feel like I, I, as a bald man, am very fortunate to have become bald in an age when it was finally becoming was destigmatized. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was, it was a gradual thing. Cause it wasn't just the thing of like this old, this old thing about bald, just not being cool. And, all these poor men th throughout history have been being feeling like they had to do comb overs and wear hats and toupees comb overs, and stuff. hats, terrible toupees. And, uh, although not only that, sorry, not only that, but in the, the late seventies, we had the, the skinhead movement. So if you yeah. Yeah, shave your head, like, like I do, even if you were bald, they would look at your shaved head. People would look at you like this in the late eighties. Yeah. They would look at you and go, what's up with that guy? Yeah. So, you know, fortunately, I, I came in, my, my baldness came right at the tail end of that period. You also have that swastika tattooed on your neck. But other than that. <laughs> yeah. Bad choice. No, you're right. You're right. It, it has moved. It, it is a, a bias, though. And it strikes me simply because I do read a lot of, I, I, I do love current comics here and there, but I've been going backwards for so many years. I really enjoy reading golden age and silver age comics. They can be really cheesy, but something like that will crack me up. And it makes me reflect. I'm like, yeah, it wasn't just DC back then bald. It was equated to evil, you know, and every, you know, like, evil scientist in the movies was basically the same thing. And you're like, what's that about? As if it's like, I am so evil. Hair won't grow on my head. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I, I when I read that story, it I was I was both really disturbed and I couldn't stop laughing. Every now and then, I feel oh, the need to share. I, I like I like him fleeing on a boat. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's he's already on his own yacht. <laughs> <laughs> And he leaves his parents like, fuck it. They're going to have to explain this shit. Yeah. He should have come back as a villain. <laughs> he should have brought him back. That, that is a villain origin story. It's as strong it does, as the Lex Luthor one. <laughs> and we know that Roger Warner is very physically capable. He should become like a bad, you know, villain. The anti-Lois villain. Yeah, and you touched on it briefly. That, that that whole the old school thing about Luther, you know, having lost his hair because of something Superman did. It's like, yeah, he can't just be bald. You know, there has to that has to be no. tied into his, no. his evil. No, it could. It, it had nothing to do with genetics. It's like yeah. I was doing the experiment as a teen scientist in in my Smallville lab, which is in a farmhouse, right. and. Right. And the chemicals I'm working with catch fire. Superboy's trying to help me. That's the thing that Luther always forgets. Superboy's like, he's about to burn to death. That's my friend Lex. <sighs> Uses his super breath, blows out the fire, but the chemicals get it, and they take his hair off. And from that <laughs> point on, a supervillain is born. I used yeah. to like Superboy. I used to do anything I could to help him in his crusade for justice. But now I'm bald. <laughs> <laughs> I will crush him and take over the entire world because I'm yeah. bald. Because yeah. I'm bald. Just like little quotes.
Yeah. yeah, no, that's uh, not a great motivator for a supervillain. Maybe there should be just like a, a group of them. Ultra Humanite, Luther, like, have you heard from Roger? <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> Roger, <Walter. laughs> right. Roger Warner reporting for duty. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, I'm glad we've come a long way. And, of course, Marvel did help. Marvel, you know, gave us Professor X. And other than his creepy, um, I'm an old man who has a crush on one of his teen students thing that they had in the first issues of X-Men, they they abandoned that. But you ever read the earliest X-Men co- uh, comics? He has a crush on Jean Grey. They're like these thought balloons where he's like going, if only I could admit to Jean my feelings. And you're like going, ooh, when you like 42, she's like 18. Stop it. And then I think even Stan Lee was like, yeah, I can't do that anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Jack, I'm starting, to, I'm starting to question myself, which is rare. But I think maybe the old man should not be part of a love triangle with the teenagers. I feel dirty. Is that wrong? I, I feel dirty, which again, rare. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, anywho, so thank you for walking down a Superman uh, path with me. I did, I did not see the bald thing coming. You set that up very well. And that's, oh, thank uh, you. I mean, it's an important message for the kids of today. Embrace your baldness. Yeah. Embrace your baldness. Embrace whatever makes you you and don't let it turn you into a supervillain. Yeah. And uh, I, I know uh, very well being uh, being someone who started losing his hair when he was nineteen. Uh, uh, it's tough. It is really, yeah. really tough. And but just but the best decision I one of the best decisions I ever made was to stop fighting it and to embrace it. You were also there. You've got a, you've I, got an you awesome were around skull. when I when I made yes. that decision. Yeah. yeah, you got a good skull shape. You got that going. For <laughs> it. Um, but I'll also say um, no. It is a good message. If you look at origins of a lot of especially classic old supervillains, a lot of them are about really dumb things that that later you would Oswald Cobblepot becomes the penguin because he was a fat kid whose mother forced him to go to school with an umbrella. The end. <laughs> what? That's why he becomes a supervillain is because he's made fun of. People are like, oh, look at the penguin, ah, ha, ha. And they also own a bird uh, shop. They they sell birds. But basically, the whole thing is like, I'm a nerd who, who is got a bird shop, and I'm fat, and I have umbrellas. <laughs> That's why I will wreak havoc on Gotham City. <laughs> I love looking at those origins and going like, God bless the writers who came later especially in the 70s and 80s where they're like going that's not good enough we've got to add different levels <laughs> he must have been born a sociopath or something we've got to do it because we can't just say yeah man you're chunky you're gonna end up being a villain sorry buddy Mm-mm. so are there yeah. are there i know that the these stories have been retold and re, reca- recast and re rewritten over the years is, is there an oh, origin yeah. story of lex that is your favorite from it's all the tricky. different generations. Some some of the writers, including we've we've talked about uh, Birthright before, which is a really good origin take. But the thing is, some writers who are really good have sold me on the Lex New Clark as kids thing. I've never liked Lex New Clark as kids, even though that's been canon to some degree since the sixties. Uh, I've never really liked the idea of, uh, and usually even the ones that stick with it, they say it was for a couple of summers. He didn't really grow up in Smallville, but he had like an uncle in Smallville. And, and so they, you know, the parents who were bickering and awful people, and they sent him out to the country for a couple of summers. I'm okay with that. And that he and Clark knew each other. Okay. But generally speaking, I prefer not. I don't like it when the villains and the heroes like are so entwined. They knew each other as kids. Look, it's little Bruce and little Joker. I don't want that. I don't want that. (laughs) Even if it had dialogue, I wouldn't want that. Um, I prefer that the villains are someone they encounter in the course of being the hero. So I'm not a huge fan of that, but I did 
like the take from Birthright. I even liked Burns' take of him being, yes, a scientific brain, but also just this capitalist, you know, like uh, business guy. Very fitting for the 80s. And yeah. also, Byrne did the, the retro thing of he had Lex lo- losing his hair. When he re- redid the, uh, the Superman origin, you introduce Lex and Lois had even dated him at some point. And she's like, Lex, just give it up. You're losing your hair. And he's like, ah, I am not. And he's got it all swept back. But And then, yeah, within a couple of years or so, it's like it's all just gone. I'm like, I like that. Also, turns out it's due to the kryptonite ring he has and that he also has gotten cancer from it, which I thought was oh, pretty yeah. cool. That, that was, was a, That was the iteration of Lex who came back as a clone, posing as yeah. his nephew yeah. or something. The, yes, yeah. the 80s into the 90s, people were picking up what Byrne had created and then going interesting places. Yes, uh, he realizes that even kry- kryptonite does affect humans, but only if they have prolonged exposure. So him being all cocky with his kryptonite ring to keep Superman at bay has actually been killing him. And then he loses his hand first, so he has a mechanical hand for a while. And then it's like, oh, no, you're dying. And he's like, fuck that. He clones himself into, and he's like a long lost nephew from Australia. So he's handsome. He also had worked his genetics to where the hair doesn't go away. So he's got long, luscious red hair and a beard. (laughs) <laughs> and, and, and he's doing an Australian accent like, I never really knew my Uncle Lex. Hello. I don't, that's not Australian. I apologize to my friends from Australia. But uh, yeah, so that was wacky stuff. But that was 80s, 90s. And then, of course, we had the death of Superman and all that stuff. And uh, He eventually lost his hair again, right? Didn't he? The, the clone I, version of life? Well, yes. And he also got exposed as eventually... Superman yeah. was able to prove to the public that's not uh, a nephew. That Alexander. is Alexander. Yeah. Yes. What that is was, was Alexander. Yeah, it was Alexander. And he's yeah. the one that hooked up with the innocent uh, protoplasmic supergirl. <laughs> oh, yeah. I, I mean, it was very soap opera for the 80s and 90s, and I kind of enjoyed it. But yeah, that was the. Um, Supergirl was not Kryptonian. She was a protoplasmic being that had taken on this shape. Uh, so she could also shape change into other people, but she was primarily Supergirl. Uh, and Clark had left her with his parents. So they kind of, for a little while, raised her too. Um, and they called her May, which was short for Matrix, because that was what her oh, name yeah. was. Oh, yeah. She was and, instrumental uh, and- she was instrumental in his return uh, when yeah. he when he came back from the dead. Yeah, she posed as With Clark Kent at a public it. event. Yeah, mm-hmm. and also yeah. John Jones did at least once as well. It's always good to have a shape changing Martian as a buddy. It's like, hey man, could you be me? It's like, sure mm-hmm. man. Uh, yeah. Excuse me, Miss Lane. What? Why? But Clark's right here. I really hope they do that in the new in these new movies. Uh, because I'm so still dying to see Martian Manhunter in a in a good continuity, you know. We've seen Me him. I mean, the, the guy, the guy who did him on Supergirl series, I thought was great. The brief appearance he had in the uh, in the Snyder Cut was great, but it sure. was like even though it served no purpose to the story, it was just great to see him. But to yeah, to he see just shows up going, "I've been watching you guys. Great, you helped us not at all, but thanks for watching." Yeah, us. yeah, that's yeah, whatever, pal. But I, I would love to see what you just said, like have him have him help out, you know, pose as Clark a couple of times here I, and there just to I kind hope, of solidify. I mean, have Gunn keeps go, saying, what? Gunn's doing that thing where he's like going, guys, I didn't say it's young Superman. It's, he goes, it, but yeah, it's early Superman, but not young early. Superman. But I hope there's not, I hope he doesn't jump the gun into them being married. And I I yeah. still like the, yeah, is push he that down Clark the road, or... Yeah. I think mm-hmm. Clark may be Superman. I still love it that. Sounds, it sounds like, and this makes sense because he is, as we know, uh, Gunn is a huge fan of the original Superman movie, which if you if you skip ahead to the Metropolis bit, it starts pretty much where he's going to start his Superman, which is him getting the job at Daily Planet or having I recently so. started there or something. Yes. That's what we've been led to believe, at least at this point, that that's, that's where he's starting the story. I so, saw a picture that, of, uh, of David Cornsweet, a recent picture, and they're going... 
he's bulking up. There's a oh, recent picture of him, and it was just like him, I think, doing some charitable thing, or it was just him in public, and he's just wearing a t-shirt and like shorts, and you're like going, oh yeah, you're bigger than you used to be. <laughs> so I think he's like, gotta get there, gotta get there, going to be Superman. Maybe yeah. I'll stop short of Henry Cavill, because that man was literally a sculpture. And I love me some Henry Cavill. Still do. Yeah, I you know, I still think he was. I mean, I, like a lot of people, I think he was done wrong. I, I he think was done wrong, and is, and people that are I, saying Gunn did him wrong, no, Snyder did him wrong. He yeah. gave him the wrong well, vehicles to be the character that he should. Yeah, have yeah, been. yeah. Well, and the, the the leadership too before Gunn, you know, them him kind of being fucked around, saying, "Yeah, sure, we'll we'll give you another movie. Go ahead and tell you're the public you're to yourself because you just said a naughty word, <laughs> <laughs> right?" Anyway. I bleeped myself. So, um, have you ever yeah. seen? Have you ever seen? This Twice? is a hard, hard switch. Uh, subject change. Uh, last night, I was just trying to take a break, give myself a break from after I'd worked on podcasting stuff. The other, the other podcast to do for the, yes. for, the for blackguards, and because uh, I hadn't really sat down and watched anything since I got back from the from the trip, and I was just poking around, and I pulled up uh, Amazon Prime. And there's this Star Trek documentary that I had never heard of before that came out a couple of years ago called What's The Center called? Seat. The Center no. Seat. Mm-hmm. It's like 50 years of Star Trek. And it's a multi-episode documentary about the full lifespan of Trek. Awesome. And it's it's addictive once you get it. It's very well done, but it's very fast paced. And it starts obviously with the beginning of the series. With it's Rod on Harry. Amazon Prime and not Paramount Plus, which it's is on Amazon where Prime. all the Star Trek is. Yeah, I don't. I mean, maybe it does on Paramount too. I don't know, but that's where I found it. And so I've, I've, I couldn't. Once I picked it up, I couldn't stop watching. I was up yeah. till like five in the morning or something, and I, I got all the way up through uh, Undiscovered Country. And so they're uh, just going chronologically. Just through the whole thing. Yeah, yeah. Well, pretty much they're kind of skipping. Right? They're they're focusing on the first few episodes. Focus on the the original series and their yeah. their the movies because they've they've kind of breezed past the the inception of Next Generation. But I'm oh. sure they're going to backtrack to that uh, at, at uh, some future uh. episode. But it's just it's really fascinating hearing it's just every every movie you, you think, you know, we know famously that the first one had a lot of problems. Pretty much every movie had a lot of problems, like from from the, the first one, the most oh, know, yeah. Star Trek motion picture through Wrath of Khan through every one of them had every one of those movies had Star some Trek major crisis. I don't place <laughs> its awkward badness on Shatner because you get into that story and you see how the studio did him wrong. They yeah. kept reducing the budget while he's filming. Mm-hmm. So by, and he's trying to do, a, and then by the end, it's like, yeah, well, styrofoam rocks will look just fine. He's like, no, you idiots. <laughs> so it's not a good movie, but it has a good concept behind it. And of course, good performances because those people, they could do that shit in their sleep. But but yeah, I don't place the blame on that. Shatner did his best, but yeah. he did his best with what they were giving him, which was nothing. One of the funniest moments in, the, in that in that episode of the documentary is as uh, one of the forget the producer's name said that you know towards after all the stuff you're talking about, all the conflicts and the budget budgetary problems that Shatner came in one point because he had been working on the edit said, okay, well. I'm done. Bye. And they're like, "Uh oh, that doesn't sound good." So they went and looked at the cut, and they're like, "Oh no!" So they wow. had to go and after after Shatner washed his hands Look, of it, which I'm sure was just not, because he was fed up. Yes, yeah. he was not the filmmaker either that Leonard Nimoy was. No offense, Mr. No. Shatner, but Nimoy was yeah. very good. Um, I recommend if you've never read it, um, uh, read them because there's a pair of them. Let me go grab it real quick. You can edit this bar out, whatever. Uh, you'll enjoy this. Okay. Oh, here it is. There are a pair of them, and they're oral histories. The 50-year mission. Ah. The first 25 years. Um, so these guys basically just interviewed everyone involved. Uh, the stars cost everybody. And it's so much that they literally had to go, this book just covers the first 25 years of Trek. The second one carry, uh, carries on the next 25 years. And it is, they go through the shows, the movies. Obviously, the second one goes into Next Generation. Um, and it's just like what you're talking about. I love hearing the people on the inside talk about it. I also love hearing them when they're really honest. 
you know, there's there's a lot of you always get the stuff about, yeah, really, no one got along well with Bill. Bill was his own thing. It's like uh, Bill and Leonard knew they were the stars, but Bill was the one that really rubbed it in. So like the feuds between George Takai and and, you know, William Shatner kind of legendary. So I, I think Shatner made his peace with everybody, but you know, all the stuff about his ego is insane. It's yeah. all. I love that, it. That's a, uh, one of the, th- there's a couple of great stories that, that uh, Nick Meyer or good old, uh-huh. good old, uh, good old Nick Meyer. Who we've talked about at length because of his God's brilliant a work on time after time. Yeah, he is. Yeah. And uh, I kind of wish he'd get back to filmmaking because he was just really good at it. Um, yeah, but I think it's isn't a, he probably in his eighties now? Yeah, <laughs> but, so yeah, that's all right. Anyway, so he tells a he tells <laughs> a couple of Murnau. good stories. F. W. Murnau is really great. Why doesn't he get back to filmmaking? He's been <laughs> dead for decades. Yeah, uh, but one, still, one of my favorite stories he tells <laughs> in the during the the making of Wrath of Khan, which was only the second movie he'd ever directed at this point. So he was a bit of a a green. What's the word? Uh, green horn still but the, in this early phase of star trek movies they had a lot of budgetary restrictions because mm. they hadn't really proved themselves to the studio yeah yet. that first one was i mean it wasn't considered a, a, a flop but they it didn't do what they wanted it to do right yeah and that was and it did uh, cost a lot for its day yeah it's amazing again with a lot, of, a lot of these movies it's amazing that that one turned out as good as it did considering they didn't even have an ending when they started filming that one that they, they came up with the ending like very late in production. Uh, but anyway, so during Wrath of Khan, because he was such a, such a, uh, a, a newbie to directing, he was, he was, uh, he had, I think he had a good relationship as he says with the, uh, with the main cast, but with, for some reason with, with Ricardo Montalban, he was kind of in awe of him and was like, hadn't really been directing him much up until this certain point in production. And they get to this one scene where uh, Ricardo has to deliver this line and unexpectedly he kind of shouts it like blah, blah, blah. I can't remember it's, it's something that happens on the uh on the planet he was left on I think before yeah. it's early in the film uh, they showed a brief brief moment of this take that I think they didn't wind up using in the movie Seti like, Alpha Six Seti maybe it was that Alpha line six. But anyway, anyway, it was a line that it was a line that was was not supposed to be over the top and yeah. so everybody was like uh oh and so Nick was like, Oh God, what do I do? What do I do? So he, he works up the courage and he pulls Ricardo aside, like takes him off into another room and said, and tells him the story. Like, I forget what the, it was some little bit of like filmmaking wisdom, you know, so-and-so said that you should never blah, blah, blah. And Ricardo goes, Oh, you're directing me. I love it. I love it I, because I have no idea what I'm doing. And I'll, then from that. there forward, it was like the relationship was great. And the producer Bob, I think his name was, said that he noticed after Nick made that breakthrough with Ricardo that the performances of of Bill, of Shatner and Nimoy went up just a little few, few more notches. Not that they were bad to begin with. He says, no. I don't know if anybody else noticed it, but I noticed it. Like, that was, you know, it's just a I wonderful moment that. of filmmaking. Yeah. Because, I mean, here's the thing. And I, I, I can see that even when, again, because of some of the terrible movies that John and I watch, for our, our podcast every now and then there'll be like really great actors in something even like we were talking about you know the blade trilogy and blade one and blade two are both great blade three is terrible and <laughs> again wesley snipes is really checked out of blade three probably for good reasons the only time he seems awake is when he's paired with someone that's actually good and you can see it become like I'm raising my game because I'm not going to be outshone, which is actually good. The competition between actors. So I bet it was a thing where once Ricardo is gotten the guidance to be amazing, which he is amazing in that movie. And Ricardo Montalban, I know fantasy Island is what people, but I've, you know, he's great in this Columbo he did where he's the killer. Yeah. And it's amazing. That guy could act and he's just a presence. But you get yeah. him in the right slot, and you know that the other two guys are like, "Oh, I thought we could just sleepwalk through this whole Kirk Spock right. thing." Now it's like, "Uh, uh-uh, yeah. here we come." Yeah. It, and yeah. that movie crackles because everybody mm-hmm. is bringing their A game, and Nicholas Meyer had the the smarts to realize, "Oh, what the first movie was lacking, 
was the feel of the show. It's like there is a certain cheesiness and a certain grandness. It's okay to be slightly cartoony because that works on an emotional level. It's mm-hmm. like grand emotion, which the first one is so beautiful and dead eyed. You're like, why is Kirk so subdued? Even though he's sitting there going, I'm just getting older. It's like, no, but you're not dead yet. And in the mm-hmm. second movie, he's like going, no, I'm still the same guy. And you're like, of course yeah. you are. God yeah. damn. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, that, I love they, that movie. I love that they, movie. Part of, I mean, this may be one of the things that made the film crackle. You can was, keep talking, uh, Chad, but I've already started it. I'm just watching Star Trek. You're two watching right now. I mean, you, no, no, keep on talking. It's okay. Uh, I want to get back to watching that documentary. It was it's really yeah, something else. I, I, but thanks the, for the, telling me about it. The other, the other story that Nick Meyer relates in that is that during that making of that movie is that when he initially finished the first treatment of the script, which he wasn't credited for apparently, at least originally, I don't know what it is Whoa. now, but when he, when he did that? his treatment of the script, he said, I'll do it for free. Just, just let me add it. Let me, let me fix this gotcha. thing. But then Bill, because everybody was happy with, Oh, this is brilliant. And they sent it to Bill and Shatner said it back. Cause I hate it. You know, I'm not happy with this. And, and, and Nick was like, what? So he, 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 I forget how he figured, like he sat down and talked with Bill or something, something he figured out that, oh, when he went, I guess maybe Bill made a list of things he wanted changed. And then he realized, oh, Shatner just wants to be the first through the door in all these scenes. <laughs> he just wants to be the featured person in, in all these scenes and not be upstage by anybody. I'm not sure if that anybody. is really that amazing an intuition. <laughs> no, no, but that's, that, that's when Nick realized that's all it was. Like, yeah. Nick was like, I'm right. I'm learning how to write for a star now. It's like, Oh, yes. I get it. Yes. So he yes. said it. He, he finished the revisions in a couple of hours and sent it back to Bill. And then Bill was called him, left his long voicemail and said, you're a genius. You're the best writer, whatever. And then Nick would use that whenever they'd have an argument later. In the direction he had a tape copy of the tape with him said yeah the I bill. Love that. and he'd play his voice going you're a genius nick <laughs> i love that because so, i think here's the thing i mean i'm sure it's got to be a pain in the ass to work with someone with, the, with an ego that big but i do think if you find the key i think yeah. you do i don't think shatner well again this is just based on what i've read and i don't think he was ever dictatorial But if you could appease him in enough, you know, just enough like that, then I think you probably was putty in your hands. I think he was like, yeah, you just had to let him know. It's like, dude, Mm -hmm. you're the alpha. You are Kirk all the way. Yeah. Um, Yeah. And then, you know, it's like he wouldn't care. It's like, what do you want me to do? You want me to wear the same red diaper that uh, that Connery did in uh, Zardoz? Okay. (laughs) <laughs> he never actually had to wear the red diaper that uh, Connery did. Have you seen Zardoz, <laughs> by the way? No, we talked about that briefly uh, a oh, few couple episodes ago. I need to see it. You do, just so you can say you've seen it. Yeah. <laughs> it's not going to change your life. In fact, you'll probably go, God damn God it, damn why it, did you make me do that? And I'll be like, <laughs> because now you know. Now you know. Anyway. Oh, and one one more thing we should, I want to touch on, just because we've talked I'm about ready. filmation so much. There's a whole episode fittingly dedicated to the animated series. Yes. And, and I need to go back and watch that. I, I had been reminded recently that filmation. It is on Paramount. It It is, but they had, and I've, I've heard of this. You've told me this too, that, uh, that show is actually remarkably good because they had a lot of the same writers working on and the whole original cast. The animation is not great. I mean, filmation, for uh, and even for filmation, it's not that great, and that's budgetary. I'm not saying because right. filmation, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. but and they did tone things down to some degree because it's for kids, but yeah, all the original writers and the original cast and some of the mm-hmm. storylines are like, this is great. And yeah. even though years later, like Roddenberry was asked, is it canon? You know, it's like you've gone on to next generation and all this stuff. So, is that animated series canon? And he goes, nah, it's not. It doesn't matter. I just read this thing where like someone did a whole chart. It's like even Roddenberry saying that the writers of all the other shows have ignored that. This is how they have taken literally done sequels. The if, do you watch Lower Decks, the cartoon? No, but they do touch on that in the documentary. They say, that. yeah, it's, it's very fun. Very fun. It, yeah. um, but like the species of the doctor on lower decks is the cat species that only appeared in the original animated series, which mm-hmm. is not shown up in any of the live action stuff, but they're like, no, we, that series, that, uh, that species is canon. I just yeah. love that the people work in. They're like, 
screw it. I don't care what Roddenberry said. That stuff happened. Yeah. Another thing they, they mentioned in the documentary that Lower Decks worked into was there was originally for uh, Wrath of Khan. Uh, no, no, was, I'm sorry. The motion picture before mm. Nimoy finally agreed to come back and reprise the role of Spock, which he was kind of down on at the time. Uh-huh. Uh, they had another Vulcan character they'd made up called Zon, X-O-N. And they, they interview, there's extensive interviews with the actor who was cast to play this character. And, you know, finally, like whatever it was, the last minute, they finally sweet talked Nimoy into coming back. So they had to rewrite the script and they wrote Zon out of it. it. Although the actor does appear in, briefly in one of the scenes, one of the one of the ships that gets destroyed by Viger early on in the <laughs> film. He's there. But they also, even though he does to appear in the film, they still cast him because they, they, were, they had him in waiting because it took forever to get this movie made. Yeah. That they they wrote him this huge check, so, as sort of like as an apology, like sorry, yeah, so Nemo's sorry, coming back. Man. So so he's like, and, the, and you can see in the documentary, he's like, I was totally happy. <laughs> Even <laughs> Nemo apologized to him. Like Nemo was like really concerned for him. Was like, how did you feel when you found out that that's you're, great? You're, 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 see, you're, you know, it's like, and he was like, I don't care, man. You're Spock. You, you belong in this movie, you know. So it's really man, cool. Come on, that movie would not have been the same if if he there, wasn't walking through that door, permission mm-hmm. to come aboard. Are you kidding me? Get out! I'd forgotten too. That's I'd, 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 I did rewatch the movie not too long ago, but I'd forgotten that that great sort of parka thing yeah. he's, he's wearing, that the black outfit he's wearing when he comes onto the bridge, yeah. and he's like not talking to anybody at first. He's like, "Man, he looks really cool." <laughs> yeah, I mean that's like uh, essentially the idea is that he went hardcore Vulcan monk mm-hmm. like after yeah. the adventures, and so that's why they're all going like, "Yeah, he's not going to come back," but it's like, "No, nope, that's my buddy." Yeah, I'm sorry, Kirk. Yeah, this, there's God. I could talk Kirk. about it for hours because I, yep. I, there's so many more episodes and so. But anyway, yeah, I highly recommend y'all check it out. Yeah, and let us know. I will watch a documentary. Have What'd you, you been watching any? Uh, and I'm sorry to jump up. Have you watched uh, Strange New Worlds this season? Yes, I think I'm all caught up on. I, th- I don't. I think I didn't finish watching the last episode. The season the finale Gorn. has Gorns. Yeah. But I did watch okay. the one that was a tie in back to Lower Decks, as you said, where they had uh, yep. Jack Quaid come in. Yep. Doing I, his. I thought that was character. rather clever. It was. I was not a, huge, was not a huge fan of the musical episode, <laughs> which wasn't, again, it wasn't bad, but it was like, oh, you guys are getting a little bit too cutesy for me. But uh, I, I appreciate say, what they were trying to do. Yes. I And they did that fairy tale episode the previous season. I think, right, I think right. it's, it is them literally saying, yes, they're saying, look, the original series, which everyone holds in such crazy high regard as they should, man, they, the shore leave episode, they were always like, let's do something wacky. And then we'll have, mm-hmm. you know, here's a hairy mud episode. It's mm-hmm. wacky. And now balance of terror us against the Romulans It's like, yeah, they would just go back and forth. So I appreciate strange new worlds being okay with doing that. I wish they yeah. would. I wish uh, Kirk would stop showing up. Yeah, that's because it's like, guys, a, don't don't lean on that. Stop leaning on that because they the were guys. Not I, bad. I've come to like him. OK, but he's not. He's, he's not, not. Yeah, he's but just also not. I just don't want Kirk wandering through Pike's story all the time because they've already fucked the canon, which I, I thought they're, for a while there it looked like they were going to be really <laughs> cool, careful and, and sort of I'm sorry, and sort of what skirt around they it. <laughs> they fucked the canon. That is going to be a, a T-shirt. Way. They but uh, yeah, them. it looked like they might be skirting around it because he came on that episode where he first came on to the Enterprise, and because he yeah. just, it was establishing canon. Kirk says, I guess now they're going to say that he was lying, but he he only met Pike briefly when he took over command of the ship, not yes. before. Yeah, and so now they're friends or buddies. But, but I know in that episode, that episode where he first comes on board, I thought, oh, they're just not going to have him meet Pike. You know, they, they'll just keep avoiding. Yes, but when no, you c- cut to, uh, uh, what is it? Um, is it The Cage is the name of the first Kirk episode, or is it, I always get them mixed up. But anyway, when when Spock uh, hijacks the Enterprise to see to Pike, I mean, literally the first kind of storyline, mm-hmm. um, there's this thing where Kirk understands that he that they serve together but he doesn't understand the depth of their friendship. And so that's kind of jarring for him because to him, Pike is literally someone that he just kind of brushed up against. So it doesn't make sense that they're like chummy buds who've hung out and had beers and stuff because it would literally be now Kirk would be like Spock. Should we 
go take care of Pike, our old buddy Chris, and instead of him going like, you are breaking so many rules doing this and da 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 da. Now it doesn't seem like it would be such a big deal because of the way right. they have fucked the yeah. cannon. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, I yeah. mean, you, you just kind of have to let that go in order to enjoy the you show. Do. But it's. But I, I still like it plenty. I like it plenty. Yeah. It's my favorite Star Trek that's on. Uh, yeah. You just I never can't get really past the cast. The cast is so good. Can't do. Oh, man. Yeah. Everybody. Everybody. Good Lord. Yep. And uh, I think they're also leaning way too hard into Christopher Pike being like a chef guy. <laughs> like every episode now has him like cooking him stuff. Cooking. And I'm like, right, dude, he's got a saddle in his like uh, in, in their conference room. I'm like, all right, I get it. But I do like that. He's not just Kirk redone. He is kind of a yes. doof. And I do like that. Pike is a little bit yeah. of a doof. Yeah. God. Yeah. Please. Anyway, so let's wrap it up. We talked about everything under the sun, but next week, possibly a special guest. Yeah. Won't that be yeah. cool? If I put these episodes out in order. <laughs> oh, you put them. Yeah. I know that you chop them up too and turn them a little, uh, little crunchy bits. I know. So you've been like going, ah, I just took a little, ch- here's a little bit of us talking about Quark, but, but not the rest of the episode. Here's a little bit of us talking about this thing, but not the rest of the episode. Yeah. YouTube is, is really big on shorts now, so we have gotten a lot of new subscribers because of those little little chunky bits. And yet, I am wearing pants. Yeah. Sorry, ladies. <laughs> YouTube is fond of shorts, but I'm bucking yeah. the trend. <laughs> I've got jeans on. They go all the way down. <laughs> yeah, that's a lesser known feature. YouTube pants. <laughs> new Get band it? name new yeah. band name youtube pants two pants um we really fucked the canon there's so many episode <laughs> titles you could use um well take care of yourself it's good to see you again my friend uh which Likewise, is german sir. for my friend uh stay cool don't be hit by any hurricanes and we will talk next week oh and you got some movies to watch i do yes i do Okay. All right, y'all. We'll see you next week. Bye. Bye. Okay, bye.